Good morning, my name is Samantha Riles from Sugar Research Australia, and I'd like to welcome you to our second milling webinar for 2020. Today, Eamon Ashtani from Queensland University of Technology will be presenting on the topic, falling film tube evaporator at Bingara Mill. Ross Broadfoot from QUT will also be in the room. Please note that today's webinar is being recorded and a copy of it and the slides will be sent to all registrants. Throughout the presentation, all attendees will be on mute. If you are having any technology issues, please send a message in the chat box, which is located on the menu bar of your webinar screen. If you experience any issues in hearing the sound coming from your computer, please feel free to join by phone. I put this number in the chat box. I will be assisting as a co-host to ensure that all runs smoothly. We encourage you to take an active part in today's webinar by asking questions. As the webinar is in listen only mode, you can do this at any time throughout the webinar by typing your question into the Q&A button on the menu bar. At the end of the presentation, there will be an opportunity for Eamon to answer these questions. I'd now like to hand over to your presenter for today, Eamon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. And um, yeah, as Sam introduced me, this is Iman Ashtiani. I joined uh, um, Sugar Industry uh, a year ago and I uh, started my work under Ross's supervision. And during the last year, I had the opportunity to work on a few projects ac across different means. And one of those projects uh, was evaluation of uh, falling film tube uh, evaporator performance at Big Romeo. And um, this presentation will cover what we have done over that project. Um, so, what I'm going to cover in this webinar will be a, a quick introduction on the falling film evaporators, and then I'm going to talk about the setup that is installed in at Big Romeo and the uh, normal um, operating conditions of that. Um, evaporator and then I will go through the methodologies that we used to get the uh, results and then interpreted the results and then I will cover the results we've got and I will finish it with a summary of this whole um, results and methodology and give you some recommendations regarding uh, the use of the falling pin evaporator in Australian needs. So, um, as uh, you may know, the uh, major um, um, demand for um, upgrading a system in a meal or in a factory uh, could be because of increasing the energy efficiency and uh, for sure there are other um, items involved, but energy efficiency is one of them. And in a sugar meal, um, steam generation is one of the critical things because Steam generation uh, can change the uh, profit of the meal and also it can increase the cost of the meal. And steam is uh, directly uh, associated with the evaporators. And um, that's why um, here we're going to talk about uh, the options for upgrading um, the older evaporators being used in the industry to a possible uh, falling film evaporator or uh, Robert. So, um, um, an evaporator, as you may know, is a unit that can uh, get the low bricks sugar juice and use the steam coming from the turbine to increase the bricks of that sugar and also generate uh, a bit of vapor. Uh, for the falling film evaporator, um, which is not really different that far, that, 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 that's not really different from uh, Robert, is, is like a heat exchanger. So what's, um, what is involved in that evaporator is a uh, top dome, uh, which has the juice distributor. And then under that, we have the calendria, which consists of uh, tubes. And then um, we have the juice chambers and the uh, separator. And under that, we have the supports. And also we have the pump that circulate the juice throughout the evaporator. So 
this image here uh, shows a typical BMA design uh, polling film evaporator. And uh, as you can see, the juice uh, comes from the ESJ tank, goes to the um, inner reservoir, and from there, it's going to be pumped to the top of the evaporator, which is the dome. And from there, it goes to the juice distributor. This is the schematic that I got from the uh, BMA website. And uh, it, the purpose of using this distributor is to evenly distribute the pump juice throughout the um, tubes. So we have the tubes in the calendria, which is in this section. And this is a schematic of uh, the pipes. So um, when the juice is uh, falling to these uh, pipes, it forms a film. And then we have the exhaust steam from the turbine that comes to the calendria. And because of the heat exchange between the steam and also the juice, uh, juices start evaporating. And the condensate from the juice goes out from the condensate. Um, sorry, it um, goes to the um, droplet separator and the vapor separated from the um, condensate uh, from the juice and goes to this uh, stream and uh, the juice comes back to the outer reservoir. And then uh, when it's been accumulated in the outer reservoir, it starts overflowing to the inner reservoir and then the recirculating uh, keeps going. Uh, also here we have uh, two vents, one on top, the other one under the um, calendria, and these two vents are being used to uh, remove the noxious gases from the uh, uh, from the vapor, and also the condensate from the steam goes out from this stream. Um, so um, also we have the emergency water stream on top. So if the uh, rate of juice inside the, the evaporator is not enough, uh, or in case of emergency, it start um, pouring water into the evaporator to stop um, forming uh, cold sugar. So uh, this is a normal um, falling film uh, evaporator. And uh, to show you how this whole concept works, I have a uh, a video that shows the principle behind this uh, evaporator. So this is not exactly the same uh, design uh, with the BMA. This is just a general generic type of uh, falling film evaporator. But as you can see on the top, uh, we have the juice that is going to the separator. So the separator is also a little bit different from the BMA, but it evenly distributes the uh, juice into the pipes. And as you can see, when the juice goes to the pipes, it starts uh, forming a type of film. Yeah. And when the film uh, goes down to the pipe, we have the steam comes into the calendria. And when the steam is condensate, the energy of this steam uh, being transferred to the film. And uh, we have a mixture of juice and also vapor inside the pipe. So next, this mixture goes to the uh, separator. So with the BMA design, we have the separator inside the uh, evaporator body, but in this case, the separator is outside, but it does the same thing. So uh, it removed the vapor from the mix mixture and send the um, droplets back to the outer uh, reservoir. And then it's gonna be mixed with the inner reservoir and recirculate back. So yeah, that was it. So next, um, just to give you uh, an introduction of how this falling film started in industry, uh, the bit sugar industry start using, started using uh, falling film tube evaporators first because 
uh, they didn't uh, have uh, have any problem with the scaling. They uh, remove all the calcium from the uh, beet sugar uh, from the beets, so uh, there is no scaling issue with them. But then, uh, cane sugar industry uh, adopted the use use of uh, falling film, and it's been reported that. 350 uh, falling film evaporators are being used across the industry. Uh, in the early uh, versions of these uh, evaporators, uh, there were a few issues uh, like caramelization of the juice, uh, juice side and also uh, scale, the scale formation inside the tube that made, uh, made the blockages. Uh, but in the recent uh, designs, so um, so these, these new evaporators are more robust uh, against scale formation and also uh, they have less drawback of uh, juice into the uh, entrainment, um, of the, the vapor stream that comes out of the entrainment and also uh, there is not much of caramelization uh, happening on the juice side. Uh, so Bingra is the first meal that um, installed the uh, falling film evaporator in Australia. And uh, as I said, this is a BMA design. So um, in the uh, calendar of this um, evaporator, we have stainless steel tubes. Uh, the outer diameter of these tubes are 44.5 millimeter and the thickness of the tubes are 1.5 millimeter. Uh, um, the common practice for the falling film tube operator is having 10 meter long tubes, but here we used 8 meter uh, instead of 10, and uh, because of that, the, um, the 5,000 square meter model uh, became 4,000 square meter. So the evaporator at Bingra is 4,000 square meter um, um, evaporator instead of the normal 5,000 square meter. Uh, also, this um, evaporator is 24.2 meter tall, so from the uh, bottom to the top. And at the base, the diameter of the um, evaporator is 3.8 meter. On the top, where the uh, steam pumps into the evaporator, this diameter increases to 4.1 meter. Um, roughly saying, the um, the footprint of this uh, evaporator is a bit smaller than a Robert, but uh, we have to consider uh, the uh, circulate, the recirculation uh, pump uh, needs its own space, uh, so uh, that needs to also be considered. Um, then uh, for this evaporator, we have a few different uh, controlling system. Uh, that control the uh, flow inside the uh, evaporator. So the level uh, is controlled through the ESJ rate. Uh, so uh, ESJ flow uh, is regulated and based on that the level can be controlled. Also the steam rate um, is controlled based on the level in the ESJ tank. Um, there are, um, Vent that let the um, that, that control the uh, steam pressure. So if the uh, head space pressure goes higher than 68 kilopascal gauge, then uh, the vapor go, goes to the atmosphere. And also the juice circulation rate is controlled by a magnetic flow rate. And as I mentioned earlier, we have emergency water activation uh, system in place. Uh, for the emergency cases or for the uh, cases we have low um, uh, juice flow rate. And uh, these are the normal operating conditions for this specific evaporator. The steam rate is around 110 ton per hour. So the steam comes to the evaporator from the turbine is at 210 kilopascal absolute. And when it goes to the calendria, it drops to 201. Head space pressure uh, on the juice side is 164 kilopascal. Uh, and uh, the pressure difference on the vapor side is around 37 kilopascal. The uh, temperature difference uh, on the vapor side is 6.3. So uh, 
the juice temperature uh, boils at around 114 and the vapor is around 120, so six, six degree difference. ESJ rate um, from the tank is around uh, 400 cubic meter per hour and uh, it circulates at twice the rate, so around 800 uh, cubic meter per hour. And uh, also we have the pressure difference across the, uh, the entrainment louvers, uh, which is uh, one kilopascal. And uh, during the chemical cleaning, um, they drop the steam rate from 110 to 45 to clean the tubes. Um, another important factor here is the wetting number. So wetting number uh, is uh, what um, uh, indicate the uh, juice circulation rate. So indeed this number is uh, how much juice, uh, how, what's the volume of juice uh, flows through the total meter of uh, circumference of the tubes. And that's a good indication to know what the rate should be for the juice circulation. Um, so here um, I'm going to talk about three different methodologies that we use to run the experiments um, at Bingro. Uh, so the first uh, thing that we did was investigating the heat transfer performance of the evaporator. So for that we used the log data through the DCS system of the factory and um, using those data we could calculate the HTC and uh, we used the steam flow rate, calendrial pressure based on the vapor pressure, juice temperature based on the vapor pressure and also the uh, boiling point elevation and uh, also the um, heated area of the um, tubes. So in this specific case for the uh, falling fin, we used the inner diameter of the tubes. Um, to, to find the total uh, heating area. Uh, then we use these HTC data that has been calculated to find a correlation between the different uh, cleaning um, uh, procedures uh, to find if there's any correlation or not. And at the end, uh, we compare the results with uh, a Robert evaporator uh, that works under the similar uh, process condition. Then uh, we did the residence time distribution uh, measurement. For that, we use lithium tracer test, which is a normal test across the industry to find the residence time of the juice. Um, and there we got the sample, uh, sample. So we got three different samples at three different uh, times. So two samples in August, one sample in October and uh, we sent them to our lab to see what's the concentration of lithium in the samples. Based on that, we could um, estimate the residence time. And we tried to keep the uh, working conditions the same for all these three tests. So as you can see, the ESJ rate was almost constant at 420 ton per hour. Steam rate, uh, it was constant at 110 ton per hour and the inlet bricks at 15 and the juice outlet bricks at 20.3. Then uh, we did the uh, suppress loss across the evaporator. Uh, for that, we got samples from the ESJ and also we got samples from the um, uh, number one, uh, from the number two effect. Uh, and then we compare the results to see if there's been any uh, suckers degradation uh, for the um, polyfilm evaporator at Bingra. And also we did the same test at uh, Milakwin uh, because there they have a Robert evaporator that works under almost the same condition uh, in Bingra. They're using almost the same type of uh, cane. So, um, we thought this would be a good indication um, for, for the purpose of this uh, project. And then we sent all the samples to the lab for HPLC um, analysis. And um, then we could uh, see uh, what's the suffrage degradation uh, across the evaporator. Uh, the last part of the, um, the project was uh, 
investigating the performance of the uh, louvers or the, the, inter, uh, the, the entrainment system. And uh, we were looking for two different things in this stage. One of them was seeing uh, the pressure difference and the pressure drop across the louvers to see if the uh, scale is forming on the louvers and how the chemical cleaning, how effective are chemical cleanings. And also we were uh, looking to see how much carryover of the juice is um, on the uh, vapor coming out of the, uh, the entrainment uh, louvers that uh, I'm going to talk about it later in the results section. Okay, so uh, starting uh, the results. So uh, first, uh, we'll go through the heat transfer part. So um, as I said, the heat transfer has been calculated uh, using the um, log data. And uh, we got the log data for the whole 2019 uh, crushing season. And here we can see the heat, uh, uh, heat transfer coefficient on the y-axis. And uh, on the x-axis, we have different weeks. So from week three to eight in this image, and then from week nine to week 14 in the next image, uh, have the um, daily um, uh, data for the heat transfer. And also on top, we can see what type of chemical cleaning has been used for um, this week. What's happening? at Bingro was because they've been affected by the drought of that year and they couldn't uh, run the factory for two weeks non-stop. They had to start early in the morning each week uh, on Mondays and then finish the factory uh, work on Saturday uh, next week. And then for two days over the weekends, they had uh, shutdown and during the shutdown, they had, chem they had clean chemical cleaning in the evaporator. So as you can see, uh, we have um, caustic soda and sulfonic acid for uh, chemical cleans. Uh, and um, as, it, as it is expected uh, from the beginning, we have we will start with higher HTC and then HTC drops over the week and it goes to its, to its uh, lowest value. So on average, the HTC start at 3,250 watt per square meter per Kelvin, and then it drops around 2,750, and it's more or less the same for all the weeks. And uh, in this figure, we have the uh, weekly average HTC over the 14 weeks. Uh, and also, again, we have the dif different uh, chemical cleaning methods uh, on the, um, this figure. So uh, we divided this figure into two sections, the first section and the second section. In the first section, uh, you can see um, over time, the value of HTC is increasing. And um, in the second um, half, we are getting almost steady HTC. Uh, uh, so the, uh, in, in the first section, we are not seeing any specific uh, correlation between the HTC and the cleaning. But next, into the second half, we can see uh, caustic soda is more effective than sulfonic acid. So uh, we are getting higher HTC uh, on a um, weekly average basis. And um, this one, this figure shows the daily average HTC for weeks 9 to 14, where we are getting steady, uh, almost steady HTC over these uh, few weeks. Uh, as, it, as it is expected, at the beginning, we, we are starting with the lower HTC, and this lower HTC is a result of um, cleaning procedure and the start procedure. Uh, it increased a little bit, and then it start decaying or decreasing, and uh, it goes to its um, lowest value. But again, at some points, we have a small increase, uh, which this increase could be because of increase in head space, uh, which increased the HTC. Uh, I will talk about this later in the uh, next section. Uh, also, um, we did um, 
we have this uh, experimental correlation that correlate the um, uh, scale formation to the HTC. So, uh, as you can see, if we know the uh, HTC of a clean evaporator, uh, we can find out after how many hours um, how the um, how bad the um, scaling could be based on the results of HTC we are getting uh, from the evaporator. So, A is the uh, scale factor. Uh, that's a coefficient shows the reduction of HTC per hour of operation. And um, for the falling film evaporator, we found this number is uh, 0.1, uh, the average, um, that's the average, and the standard deviation is 0.05. Uh, for Robert evaporator, this number is reported to be on average 0.08. But uh, uh, we should consider the range of this number. Uh, th this number could be really different from meal to meal. So in some meals, it's really low, 0.04, and we have a really high number as 0.2 in different meals. So uh, this uh, 0.08 is the average between all the meals. Uh, knowing this number for falling film evaporator is 0.1, we can estimate uh, within two weeks of work, uh, with falling film evaporator, the uh, HTC could drop from 3,250 to something around 2,030, uh, 2,300, uh, which is a prediction based on this number, but the result shows the drop goes as low as 2,750, so the prediction is a little bit lower based on this uh, correlation. Then we have the residence time. So as I mentioned, the residence time um, is based on the lithium tracing test. So what we've done there was uh, mixing one kilogram of uh, lithium chloride with ESJ and then pour it to a vessel, pressurized vessel and injected that uh, mixture into the incoming um, uh, ESJ to the evaporator. Um, as it, it is expected, we have a delay, so there is no concentration of lithium, of lithium in, in, uh, at the beginning. And then we have a sharp uh, jump, it goes to its peak, and then we have a decay, exponential decay. So the delay at the beginning is because the juice needs to go from the uh, inner reservoir to the circulation uh, pipe and from there to the uh, distributor, from distributor to the pipe. So during this period, you are not seeing any concentration of lithium, and then it goes to its maximum uh, when um, it comes down. And then we have this exponential decay, which shows the mix between the outer, uh, the, the juice that comes to the outer uh, reservoir, and then the overflow of that, um, that juice is um, going to be mixed with the inner, inner uh, reservoir and then it's going to be recirculated. So um, we estimated, uh, we, we calculated the uh, mean uh, residence time for the uh, falling film evaporator is around four minutes and to pass through 95% of the whole juice it takes around 12 to 15 minutes, uh, which is really uh, low residence time. And uh, it's good if you're looking to have less uh, Socrates loss. Uh, these are the results of three trials that we've done. So two in August, one in October. Uh, the first trial that we've done um, is not that reliable because we haven't fixed the uh, procedure of running the test. So uh, the next two uh, trials are more reliable. Uh, here we can see the delay between number C and number B are a little bit different, and that could be because of having different uh, circulation circulation rate. So here we have much smaller circulation rate, so it's expected to have a bigger delay. But with increasing the uh, the circulation rate. So this delay drops to half of what it was. But 
As you can see, the mean residence time for both cases are more or less the same, and the CV is again in the same range. And uh, as I mentioned earlier in the methodology, uh, we tried to keep the uh, process um, parameters the same for all the cases. Here, we normalized the uh, mean residence time and uh, the density of um, the residence time density distribution uh, to compare the falling field uh, um, residence time with Robert um, evaporator. So the, the yellow color represents the residence time of a Robert vessel, which is at broad water. And we can see uh, the trend is almost the same for all the cases. So we have a small a delay. The delay is much smaller for the case of Robert. And then we have an increase in the concentration. It's not as sharp as uh, falling film. And then we have the decay. But the interesting thing to know here is the uh, average residence time for Broadwater or for Robert uh, Vessel uh, is around 8.6 minutes, which is almost twice as what we have for falling film. And then, as I said, uh, it takes 12 to 15 minutes for the 95% of the juice to go out the system in a, a falling film evaporator which is not the case for the Robert. In the case, in a Robert case, this number increases to around 29 minutes, uh, which increases the chance of a sucrose degradation. Um, next, we did the sucrose loss uh, measurement. So we got the samples uh, from number two uh, back and uh, from DSJ. And then uh, so, uh, we compared the results. So as you can see, the uh, so the first three samples are from Bingra, and also we got the samples from Melequin. Melequin uh, has um, Robert Wessel and we have um, falling film at Bingra. So we have almost the same uh, starting pH, and as you can see, we have a small drop with the uh, falling film. So this drop is a little bit larger with the Robert. And also here on 23rd of August, I think this result is not that much of, um, it's not like really trustable because it doesn't show any sucrose loss. But uh, for the other cases, we have a little bit more of drop in the pH. And also the measured sucrose loss is a little bit higher for the case of Robert compared to the uh, falling field. But still, like on average 0.13% uh, loss is quite high when we compare it to the predicted sucrose loss. So we were predicting this number to be 0.08%, uh, which is on average 0.13%. So we think it's better to run more trials to uh, confirm um, what the correct number could be. And um, yeah, next, um, we uh, did some measurements on the, the entrainment uh, system to find the efficient, efficiency of the system. So these results are the pressure, uh, differential, uh, the, the pressure difference across the louvers uh, over 24 hours uh, on one specific day. As you can see, we have some peaks here. These peaks represent the time that uh, steam uh, uh, steam rate increase because the vacuum pan goes offline. So um, these are representing uh, those steam rates. And also we couldn't find, uh, so before going any further, they have uh, like five minutes spray wash of the louvers over, at, uh, over each eight hours to clean the uh, louvers. But we couldn't see any difference, uh, any any indication on this plot on this plot that shows the time of uh, water spraying on the louvers. Uh, the other thing that we noticed over the whole season was the average of this differential pressure increase from one kilopascal to one point three kilopascal. Uh, that shows the formation of scale on the louvers that couldn't be removed using the chemical cleans. 
but still like uh, 0.3 kilopascal uh, is uh, not like a big difference. And also the other thing, uh, using the results from the uh, juice, uh, from the uh, vapor comes out of the, the entrainment system, uh, we found the concentration of, of suckers there is one to two uh, ppm, which is negligible and it shows the, uh, uh, the entrainment system uh, works um, fine and uh, we are not getting that much of carryover on the vapor side. So um, after talking with the people working in the mill on the evaporator uh, and also doing all these uh, analyses, uh, we come up with a few recommendations uh, on how to use uh, more effectively this uh, falling film evaporator. Uh, so the first thing that we noticed was uh, the magnetic flow rate uh, doesn't give a reliable um, signal, so it's always low on the signal. So uh, to um, to trigger the emergency water, it's better to use the amp from the recirculation pump. That's a better um, system to uh, trigger the emergency water. Uh, next. Um, so having a set point for the uh, uh, vapor, uh, for the header space vapor pressure at 68 kilopascal gauge um, is a must because if we uh, if we don't have this uh, set point, um, the crushing rate and the uh, vapor pressure doesn't match up, and then you have higher capacity in your evaporator compared to your um, uh, crushing rate. Then uh, we found that uh, the chemical clean um, that is used for Robert is effective for uh, falling film as well. Um, in some cases, caustic soda uh, shows a better performance. Also, um, it's important to notice um, the startup. Uh, um, it's better to use preheated uh, ESJ or preheated water for start of the uh, evaporator because it decreases the thermal stress on the vessel. If we don't do it, uh, it uh, the, the, the evaporator starts with lots of noise and you, you can see the water hammer happening inside the vessel. Also, um, the, the other important thing is uh, to know uh, around 12% of the steam comes into the uh, evaporator at this specific um, falling film evaporator at Bingra is used to increase the temperature of juice uh, to the boiling point. So it's really beneficial to have uh, a preheating system in place to uh, save a little bit on energy. So uh, for conclusion, we have, um, we have done the HTC um, uh, analysis and we checked the performance of the heat transfer efficiency of this evaporator. Um, the result shows um, the evaporator is working um, with the same rate as a good uh, Robert uh, evaporator in the industry and uh, at number one effect. And also the scaling rate is more or less the same as a Robert. Uh, just you have to notice the result we got for uh, falling film is over five days of operation. But for Robert, these results are coming from uh, two weeks. Uh, the other thing is, as I mentioned, caustic soda uh, shows a better uh, performance in cleaning the tubes. Uh, and um, we noticed the entrainment system work effectively, effectively and we don't have much of uh, carryover juice with the vapor. The mean resistance time of uh, falling film evaporator is around four minutes, uh, which is almost half of a Robert. And Sartre's loss, uh, losses of this evaporator is around 0.13% uh, on the, uh, in this vessel, uh, which is still high knowing we have much smaller residence time and also uh, the temperature, the boiling temperature of this vessel is around two degrees smaller than the normal Robert. Um, 
but again, uh, it's better to have more uh, trials on this specific uh, case for the suckers loss to get a, um, better numbers uh, or uh, more reliable numbers. Um, so, a recommendation for future work: if a meal is if a meal is interested to put um, falling film evaporator and replace the old Roberts, uh, we can suggest uh, the um, falling film are good replacement for number one and number two uh, positions um, because there uh, we have less scaling and we have higher temperature. So having shorter residence time decreases the chance of suckers degradation. And uh, still, uh, falling film evaporator can be used in the, um, uh, in the tail end as well, but uh, the, um, the meal should consider uh, the, the consequence of having more scaling on the evaporator and the cleaning and all the uh, other issues that come with, com comes with it. And um, yeah, so um, that was it. And I also want to thank uh, the uh, Malakuin staff, Bingro staff, and uh, Bundaberg Water, Bundaberg Walker's engineering staff that helped us uh, to um, do this, um, project and also specifically I want to thank Neil uh, from uh, Bundaberg Walkers, uh, Robert Zon and Salesh Kumar from uh, Bingra that really helped us throughout this project and also the staff at QT Lab and also SRA for funding this project. Uh, thank you very much and that was it. Okay, thanks, Eamon. So we now have an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, keeping in mind, um, Ross Broadfoot is also in the room with Eamon this morning. I've got one question in the box already. Um, what would you expect would happen if you went to three-week operation between cleans? So uh, if we um, if we just um, use the scaling factor that we came up with, which is 0.1, and uh, consider that um, as as a reference, so we are expecting over three weeks of not have, two weeks of not having any clean, the uh, heat transfer gonna drop to something around 2,300, uh, which is quite um, like normal with the Robert result. So it's not really, um, uh, it doesn't have a bad effect. And having just like five days of result, you're seeing like uh, the drop of heat transfer is not that much. So I think um, we really don't, don't get. We, uh, yeah, Ross Broadford here, we got a fair bit of data from different factories overseas. And um, I guess most of them were running on the number one and number two for about 14 days uh, without any real issue. So I think for 14 days, um, as Ramon indicated, you know, probably come down to around 2,300 based on the information there and, and our um, information from overseas. Um, we haven't projected what the figure would be in three weeks, but obviously it's going to be possibly in the 1900s or somewhere around there, uh, based on that scaling rate. Okay, thanks. Um, next question, was the recirculation rate about half or twice the ESJ rate? No, it's twice the ESJ rate. So ESJ rate coming from the ESJ tank is 400 cubic meter per hour, but the rate of recirculation is 800 cubic meter per hour. I just had one point there is the critical number for operating full and film evaporators is that wetting number. And that value that uh, was being used at Bingra, 1600 litres per hour per metre of circumference, is pretty typical. And from what we understand, that is used, whether it's one, two, three, four, or fifth vessel. Um, and that number determines, once you lock in that number, that determines then your recirculation rate. 
And for a 4,000 square metre unit, at that number, you need 800 cubic metres an hour. And that's, that's how that came about. Okay, um, hopefully I've got this right. Uh, 68 kPAG seems low for vapour out of a number one evaporator. Does Ross have any comments on this? Uh, that's the um, that's 68 kilopascal gauge for the renting. Yeah, um, I think the, the figure that's, that we experienced in normal operation, or bigger experiences in normal operation is about 63 kPa. Um, that's a 37 kPa drop across the foil film evaporator itself. Uh, the reason for them having that vent facility is because if the vapor pressure gets too high, um, then it means that the tail end of the set is capable of doing much higher, will, will process a lot more juice and obviously uh, get out of kilter with the crushing rate for the factory. So that was the main purpose of that vent. But so, uh, yeah, the 37 kPa pressure drop across the actual foil film evaporator is quite a good figure. Not, not that different from what you'd expect with a Robert. Um, but yeah, so it's a, it was a good figure to see 37 kPa. Okay, uh, so there are our three questions that we've had. Um, feel free to still type in a question as I do my conclusion and I can come back to it. Um, but I'd like to thank you all for attending our second SRA milling webinar. We hope that you found it of value and are keen to get feedback from you. Tomorrow you will receive an email with recording and slides and a link to a survey that we'd like you to complete. It will only take a few minutes of your time and will allow us to improve our webinars in the future. Our next milling webinar will be held on the 6th of May and will be presented by Dr. Florin Plaza from QUT who will speak about the effect of shredding on soft canes. Please go to the SRA webpage to see any of our upcoming webinar topics. Just have one more question come in. Can we ask about the cost comparison with a Roberts? Uh, I think this is a question for Neil or uh, Robert uh, to answer. Are they there? Then? So, um, Neil or Robert, I don't have you registered for as participants, but are you one of the um, people on phone? Unfortunately, it um, doesn't look like they're on the call. Okay, well, I'll, I'll make a statement. <laughs> it's a disclaimer with this statement. <laughs> um, from what I understand, it, it did come in cheaper than they would that Bundaberg would expect for a Robert. And I think if I'm quoting Neil Sector correctly, but not a great deal. <laughs> so so uh, you can interpret that how you like. So the expectation is it would come in cheaper, uh, but marginal. And that's obviously, the only thing to remember of course is that the, um, uh, the footprint for these vessels is quite a lot, lot smaller. Uh, we estimate a similar size um, Robert could be about 6.8, now 7 metres, whereas this one's 3.8 on the ground, uh, but you need the, the pump. And um, the, the big determining factor in putting evaporators into any factory is the access to the particular site. Uh, this one at Bingra was obviously outside, which saves some money. Uh, so there's a few things to consider in determining the cost. But from what I understand, yeah, likely to be a bit cheaper. Okay, we've had a few more questions file in. Uh, was there any measurements done on steam on cane? Uh, off the top of my head, uh, I can't remember what Bingra was running, but they. Um, so they're not, they wouldn't be regarded as being a highly steam efficient factory from the point of view that their, their pan stage is running on uh, uh, LP, I think. And um, as you can see from there, that our, our 
evaporator there was taking 110 tonne an hour of steam and they were doing 400, or about 400 tonne an hour of cane for that order. Uh, but you know, it's where the, where the other exhaust steam is being used that we don't have figures on. Any idea why the sucrose loss was higher than expected? No, that's a really good question. Um, obviously, typically we normally get a, um, we measure a sucrose loss in rubber evaporators slightly lower, say 80% typically of our predicted value using Vukov. And um, we had expected that. For some reason we've come in substantially higher than the predicted. And uh, it's a real puzzle. It'd be great to have the opportunity this year to do those, those uh, repeat those measurements. Uh, I will say, Bingra set up a, a really fantastic arrangement for us. It was all hard, hard piped. Um, so, pretty good confidence in the, in the methodology. I don't see any problems there at all. Uh, it was all being cooled. All the all the samples were being cooled as collected, passing through a coil. But uh, no, we don't have an answer for that, and I reckon it's it's a very important thing to determine. Okay, our last question here: the FFTE is supposed to have a low delta T, but this is apparently not the case here. Is there some explanation for this? I I don't think they do have a lower delta T. Not not substantially different from Robert at the front end of the set. And then by that I mean number one, number two, and number three. Um, and we got a lot of information, as I said, in a previous project from overseas. And we concluded there that the HCCs for those first three vessels were very similar to what we see in our Robert vessels. If you look at the literature, they quite often quote lower values from Robert evaporators than we achieve in Australia. So that might be one reason why the thinking is that a falling film vessel will be better than a robot. But I'd say we should, we should plan in Australia that our, any falling films that go in will be similar HCCs at number one, two, and three, um, and probably, probably similar scaling rates. So four and five, they can possibly, FFTEs can possibly get a higher HTC. And, but more importantly, they can probably run, or they can run with a lower delta T because you're using the pump to provide the, um, if you like, the energy to, to lift, lift the juice. Whereas in a uh, Robert vessel at number five, you've got to have at least 20 degree delta T by 25 to give you the rising film action. So uh, probably importantly for one, two and three, I think the results we'll, we'll see will be similar to what we experience on our robots in Australia. Excellent. Uh, that's all our questions for today. Um, so we might wind it up there. Thanks everyone for coming along and we hope to see you at the next webinar on the 6th of May. Thank Thanks you. Very much. Thanks. Bye.